Hello and welcome to the seventh annual Stoked Spokes Adventure Series. My name is Jason, co-founder of Swift Industries, and I will be your host this evening. I hope this is actually broadcasting. It's been a little while since we've done a, a live broadcast, so um, I did try and make some lighting better. That's exciting. Anyways, uh, if you're tuned in right now, it's January 27th, 2001. Uh, if you're looking at this in the future, thanks for tuning in. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so you, like I said, you're turned into the to the first episode of Stoke Spoke. What is Stoke Spoke? You might be asking yourself. Well, here in Seattle, we've been uh, about seven years ago. We started a little event we called Stoke Spoke, and it was a way to bring all of our bike camping friends and community together during the long, uh, cold, rainy Pacific Northwest winter. Um, and people enjoyed it, and so we're still doing it. Um, Stoke Spoke is an uh, adventure and route sharing series. Uh, I like to describe it as a um, kind of a DIY TED Talk with community-sourced bike adventures. Um, <clears throat> uh, we've been asked for a number of years now to somehow record or video uh, the events. And it's never really worked out in a very good way. And uh, who knew it took a global pandemic to finally give us a little push and make this virtual to our, our broader uh, Swift Industries bike adventuring community. All right. Uh, I'd like to take a quick moment and acknowledge the land that we are on. Um, Swift and myself reside in Seattle, Washington, which was built upon the unceded territories of the Duwamish Coast Salish ter uh, tribes. Uh, we honor the present and ancestral stewards of these lands and acknowledge the privilege of living in these beautiful places. We recognize the responsibility we have to care for these lands and practice good stewardship to educate ourselves of native histories and the present and to support indigenous led activism. Thank you. Now for some quick announcements, updates and some shout outs. Uh, we just announced as of today, you know, maybe six hours ago, a bunch of new 2021 product that we're really excited to show everybody that stuff is on our website and will be available as it rolls off the sewing machine floor over the next couple of weeks. So please go to Swift, uh, swiftindustries.com is something else, uh, builtbyswift.com <clears throat> to check that stuff out. Um, next up we have where I just lost track. Um, uh, if you don't already know, we started a little, kind of sibling company to Swift called Swift Adventure Co. It's um, basically where a lot of the experiences that we'd like to, uh, to, to give people is, are gonna live. So over there, we are offering guided bike trips, uh, outdoor bike-based workshops and exploration along with wheel building classes and a lot of stuff that explores the Pacific Northwest. We also have a fleet of awesome adventure ready rental bikes and bags. If you're visiting Seattle or if you live here and need something a little extra. Um, so check that out. We're optimistic that 2021 will be able to offer a full season of programs and adventures. Um, all right. I did mention that this is a series. So this is part one out of four. We're really excited for our next, uh, well, we're excited about all three of the next present uh, episodes, but the one in February is going to be for our women, trans, and femme, and non-binary non -bin non friends, and 
March is going to be for our BIPAC friends. Both evenings are going to be hosted by our dear friends, Jess Kim and Devin Cowens. So please um, mark your calendars for those. They're the last Wednesday of every month through April. If you're interested in presenting at Stoke Spoke, it's open to anyone. The space is limited, but check out in the show notes or on our blog for more information about submitting a route to Stoke Spoke or reach out to Swift Industries directly. You can get our email off of our website, builtbyswift.com. And uh, finally, I'd like to give some really big shout outs to our presenting partners, Velocio Cycling Apparel, Topo Designs, Ride with GPS, and The Radivist. All right, now we're getting close. I can't, I can't follow along with all the comments. Sorry, everybody. I think Martina's in the chat, chatting with folks. So there you go. Um, all right, so the way this is gonna run is I am going to introduce each speaker one at a time. Um, they're gonna give their presentation and at the end of their presentation, we'll have time for some Q&A. I will ask folks to save their questions for that Q&A session. That way I can better keep track of and to um, see your questions coming in. Um, so we'll try to get to as many questions for each presenter as we can. Um, there will be, um, in the show notes, I will link to a Ride With GPS link that will take you to um, each presenter's route. Um, that also exists on our blog, at, on Swift Industries blog. Uh, keep in mind, use common sense when you're using these routes. Uh, road conditions change, um, road closures happen, um, trails disappear or get washed out. So just pay attention, uh, don't follow blindly. Um, and then if anybody needs closed captioning uh, on YouTube, on the bottom bar here, down here, there should be a little closed captioning symbol. And if you click that on, you should be able to get some live captioning. All right. With that, let's bring in our first presenter of the evening. First up, we have Jessica Levine. Jessica is a public school science teacher by day and a bike or an outdoor explorer most of the rest of the time. She's also a photographer and a writer. Jessica, do you have anything else to add? Oh, thank you so much. And just a quick shout out to my dad who's here, kind of give me the spirit of adventure from the very beginning. Awesome. All right, let's bring Jessica's presentation up and then I'm going to dip out and let her run the show for a little bit. Great. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, you're welcome. Awesome. All right. See y'all in a little bit. Great. I'm really excited to present to you tonight my story about pedaling the Puget. It's plan C to see the Salish Sea um, by saddle. And uh, we're all here in this virtual space um, because of the obvious shift, not just a lane shift and not just a gear shift as us and cyclists, but this just global paradigm shift. And as I was riding around in the spring this summer training for what I hoped was going to be a summer tour in Europe, I just kept seeing signs, signs that I was going to be going a different way. It, it didn't hurt that I actually was going my way. Uh, I'm Jessica and this is my way. Um, and this is my bike. Uh, I ride a salsa via named Olive. And together we take this two wheeled way. And while we were on it, we just kept seeing signs of our place in the Northwest. We kept seeing signs of a path less traveled. And as a science teacher, I have ample time to wander and to roam on my bike. And I'm also keenly interested in noticing things and spending time outside. I had taken a previous cross-continent bike tour and I've done lots of local overnights, but I planned this two week adventure to pay more attention to the Puget, to pay more attention to the place. I designed it mostly solo, but you'll see that some riding buddies came along and please know I am not a fast cyclist by any means and I do not geek out about gear. 
It's the roaming and the riding and the rambling without reservations that I really thrive and jive off of. And it gave me time over these two weeks to just write and read and reflect on stories. And I think living that life here in the Puget Sound, I've been instructed, as Mary Oliver said, to sort of just pay attention and be astonished and tell about it. So the story I want to tell you today then is just not only about this 350 mile route right from my home, but it's really about the riches of this region. I'm going to sprinkle in some biology and beaches and bakeries and breweries and boats and bridges that really connect it all together. It's what makes living here on the Puget a life worth living. So let me take you on a loop. Let me show you the sights and uh, stick around for the sound. I rolled right from my home, which is really great. And I rode to the first day to Manchester State Park and nearly all of my camping choices and thus my daily distances, no more than like 40 miles a day on average and some days way less, um, were all based on the location of these state and county parks. So I began right on the beaches of my own city. Uh, here's Alki Beach in West Seattle. And as I rounded the point, I saw this low tide and I knew I would be treated to low tide during most of my daylight hours, which was really exciting. Because our Coast Salish elders have an adage that says, when the tide is out, the table is set. And that's not true just for humans, but other marine foragers like otters and eagles. And if you haven't figured out by now, I think riding a bike, the world is your oyster. And here in the Northwest, we don't need reservations to get on a ferry. You can just ride right on. Super easy, roll right to the front and be rewarded with those views of the sound. And so when I crossed over to the Olympic Peninsula by ferry, it's a really great place to ride. Wide shoulders, very little traffic. And while our July was cold and cool, the roadside was teeming with really cool wildflowers. And then I get to spend the night in this wooded and wonderful hiker biker site at Manchester State Park. So the next day I took another small ferry uh, from Port Orchard to Bremerton and rode the northern section of the Kitsap Peninsula. And without Washington State Ferries, this route would not at all be possible. One of the joys for me of solo cycling is the serendipity. I just love noticing things and stopping to check them out. So you would too notice this fellow in yellow if he was riding in the opposite way. So I flagged him down and said, hey, let me tell you about where I'm going. Where are you coming from? Just listening to people while you're out there on the bike is a joy. Um, and it turned out that um, Jim had written a book with his wife many, many years ago called Around Puget Sound by ferry boat and bicycle. Uh, it's out of print, but I'm so glad that I chatted with him because he too knew the value of cycling in this region and the joys that it can bring. It's a really rich place, totally beautiful with inlets and fjords and mountains and fish. You might think I was talking about Scandinavia, but it's why our Scandinavian settlers came to this region and because it felt so much like home. Right here, in fact, I'm biking along Viking Way into the town of Polsbo. Which led me to the Kitsap Memorial State Park, the beautiful log cabin, uh, which are for events and really open stands of hiker biker sites. And again, it's cool in the Pacific Northwest in July, so campfires are always a nice treat. Another highlight of this particular park uh, and campground location is a, a really close by corner store, which has great access to beer, making this a really popular location for Seattle overnights, um, including a Swift industry friend. You'll see Jess hosting a couple of future events as Jason mentioned. And then day three, riding off of the Kitsap Peninsula to the Olympic Peninsula, all the way up to Fort Warden State Park. And in order to ride from the Kitsap Peninsula to the Olympic Peninsula, there isn't a ferry. Instead, there's the Hood Canal Bridge. And it is long and a little bit nerve wracking, but when I saw those seals swimming along with me while I was riding, I knew I was in good hands. 
And then I got treated to another delight and an adventure. Um, just along the highway here, my GPS told me to bank uh, a right and cut the hypotenuse. So I went under a gate and ended up on this gravel road along the Shine Quarry. And I was alone with the beauty and the silence of nature, the gravel beneath me, and my favorite wildflower, or actually the jam berry, the thimble berry, uh, right off to the side, matching my front panniers. It was really awesome. And the adventure continued because when I got to the end of the road, as some of you've been, I actually had to ferry my gear and play limbo to get out the gate on the other side. Then I continue down the Chimicum Valley and ride into Port Townsend, a beautiful little arts community. And when I mean arts community, that means there's new things to look at and to appreciate, like this fence. Along the back streets of Discovery Road, there was lots to discover. So I rolled into Fort Warden, down the hill by the officer's quarters, where the film Officer and a Gentleman was actually shot, all the way down to this beautiful beach. It's a stunning two mile beach section. And from the pier here, you can peer out at all these sedimentary systems and see how the ecology of the landscape has changed over time. Um, Fort Warden is a really fantastic place. And along with Fort Flagler and Fort Casey, um, they're known as the Triangle of Fire. There's these three big forts um, in this area constructed in the 1890s all the way to 1917. Um, and I find that the combination between this natural beauty and this stark architectural concrete beauty, um, something that makes peddling the Puget a wonderful opportunity. There are lighthouses. Here's the Point Wilson Lighthouse at Fort Warden State Park, guarding the entrance to Admiralty Inlet. And when you go around the point, you can look out on the Strait of Juan de Fuca all the way across to the other San Juan Islands and to Fort Eby on Whidbey Island and you can see the riches of the Salish Sea. I'm always looking for what's underneath and I'm always sort of searching for whales. Or I'm looking into the skies and seeing what alights and delights me like our bald eagles. And while the camping location at Fort Warden is not so snazzy, um, I did stay two nights just to explore. Uh, so on day five, I left from Fort Warden and went up to Shaw Island County Park in the San Juan Islands. Uh, that meant another ferry into Coopville, um, and Whidbey Island has really great trails, kind of quiet roads, um, but not always quiet skies, because Whidbey Island is the home of our Navy, and those Navy planes occasionally buzz overhead. You can see some of them if you accidentally take the GPS route down Alt Field, uh, because the GPS route thinks that you can cut through the base, um, but you can't. So then you got to go back uphill. But at least, at least you can get a photograph out of it. And then we headed further north, and I thought we would camp at Deception Pass State Park, but we were there by lunch. So we pushed on across the Deception Pass Bridge, and I stopped just to look at the color of the Salish Sea, a beautiful teal color from this high angle. From Anacortes, we took another ferry. The San Juan Island ferry system heads to Shaw Island, which is the smallest of the four islands served by the ferry system. Um, this is the only terminal that has a unique sign. This uh, is a native orca petroglyph um, on Shaw Island. And it's a popular destination because it's just two miles from the ferry to Shaw County Park. And the mornings there are beautiful. There's a vast beach coastline, beautiful morning mist. And if you get up early enough, you'll notice you're not alone. Can you see the otters? <laughs> the whole family of otters, so fun, so fun. Traveling around the San Juan Islands, um, please don't be confused by this map. Uh, on day six, this map mostly shows that inter-island ferry is free and fun. There was honestly very little riding. But I did end up at Spencer Spit State Park on Lopez Island. There was just lots of exploring to do there, reading and watching the tides, watching the sunsets. I spent two nights there. And on day eight, I left Lopez Island and headed to Obstruction Pass State Park on Orcas Island. 
Uh, I've been to Orcas Island numerous times by bicycle and camped at Moran State Park. It was this ranger at Spencer Spit who suggested obstruction pass. Um, there's not a single traffic light on all of Orcas Island, but it is the hilliest. So we rolled and rolled over those hills all the way to the trailhead. Trailhead, huh. Okay, so to be fair, the ranger did say it was a bit of a hike down to the campground, but this hike a bike adventure was really only the beginning. Uh, because we were awoke in the middle of the night by aggressive raccoons, really sneaky. They unrolled the panniers and uh, thankfully the panniers weren't damaged because they bothered to unroll them rather than eat through them. We lost a little bit of food and a little bit more sleep and we did what we could to let others know about these real terrors. So needless to say, I was eager to get out of there. Uh, and on day nine, I rode from Obstruction Pass uh, State Park all the way to Friday Harbor on San Juan Islands at a friend's house. And uh, it turns out that hiking a bike uphill on little sleep is way easier than fighting gravity on the way down. Um, and even though that was easy, we certainly wanted a reward of bakeries and really tasty beverages at the Orcas Island Winery. Friday Harbor uh, to San Juan County Park is just 12 miles across town. I picked up a couple of provisions at the Island Market because I plan to spend a couple of days at San Juan County Park. Because it is absolutely stunning. Scenic byways and plenty of things to notice. Lavender, farms, and uh, these repurposed submarine and steel vessels, which are kind of clever. Really, San Juan County Park is the gem. It's the most beautiful campsite on this route and I was so grateful to stay for days, just reading, relaxing, flying my kite, just being outside looking for whales. Um, the other cool thing though is I took some side trips from this base. I wanna tell you about two of them. Um, one is just five miles north uh, to Lime Kiln State Park. And uh, it's along the whale trail. I was really hoping to see those whales, um, but didn't. And, and as you head there, um, take a look in the side of the road. Uh, the Christmas tree shop has miniatures of all the island architecture perched on mossy rocks by the side of the road. Again, if you ride slow, you got lots to pay attention to. You can look for the signs. Um, the other excursion I took was to get on the water. Um, there is little cell phone service at San Juan County Park, which is a joy. Um, but should you need to call out, you can just use this free phone that's there. And I used it to call the kayak company and get on a boat. I mean, the travel tour was much of a vacation. This was my longest day, 13, all the way from San Juan County Park, back on the mainland, down the I-5 corridor um, to the town of Marysville. I had my last photo on Harrow Strait looking out into Canada and ended up back on the mainland on a loop home. Uh, in Anacortes, I found the Tommy Thompson Trail, this tiny little spit across an old rail trail uh, across the Fidalgo Bay Aquatic Reserve. And into the Skagit County following herons in overhead, um, it's the confluence of all of these floodplains of the Skagit River and the Swinomish Rivers that makes our soil super rich. It's our agricultural region uh, of the Northwest and I biked really slowly, checking out crop names and fence rows, checking out barns and checking out the snow-capped peaks of the Cascades. This is why we ride here, flat roads and lots to look at. Um, I made a bathroom stop along Mc Lake McMurray Road uh, and felt really good to pop in and give gratitude for my experience as a graduate of the National Outdoor Leadership School. Uh, I think they really helped instill that love of adventure and solo travel for me. Uh, then I ended up into the shade shortly after this barn. The historic Nakashima barn is at the northern end of the Centennial Trail. Um, the trailhead was dedicated in 2012 to this hardworking Nakashima family who once owned the land here and couldn't return to it after Japanese internment. This is part of our story of the Puget Sound. Uh, the rail trail uh, offered a lot of shade on a really long and hot, hot day. Um, I ended up at a warm showers host and I need to give the warm showers tons of props and credit because when I planned this as a loop, I really only could have done so with the generosity of warm showers host on that I-5 corridor on the mainland. Um, I stayed with a 
uh, a couple who had hosted hundreds of cyclists along the way, but I was there first during COVID and I set up my tent in their garden. The other thing was funny is that um, on day 14, I headed to another warm shower host. You see, when I contacted two of them, uh, they both said yes. And so since I was on an adventure, I cut my southbound route short uh, in half with a stop in Clinton on the south end of Whidbey Island. Getting there wasn't super easy. Um, navigating was a little bit challenging, even though I had notes from my host. Uh, I wound my way over the slough and then back over the Snohomish River on a sidewalk that was just big enough for my panniers. And then Everett got really weird where I was riding on the wrong side of the road on a super wide sidewalk that was signed as the Mill Town Trail. Clear enough. And I ended up at this tiny little cabin on Pegasus Ranch at the home of these warm showers folks. And again, I'm on vacation. So I went into Langley for some oysters and a chance to just embrace that salt air. More signs of the sound. On my final day, I woke really early and rode 20 miles to the marina in Edmonds, where friends had invited me to spend the entire day on the Salish Sea. What an amazing opportunity to spend the day under sail. Then I got back on my bike and rode the last 18 miles home before sunset. And I rode along the interurban trail from shoreline to Seattle. And not only did I begin this physical journey home, but sort of a mental one. In fact, though, I realized I was home on my bike and I was just living outside. I was living without windshields and without reservations, and I was just wide eyed at this wondrous ecosystem. The bikes, the beaches, the bull kelp, the eagles, the salt, the shade, the oysters, and the people of Puget Sound. I'm home on my bike and pedaling through a pu pandemic, seeing all these signs. I knew I was right here on the Puget. It's an important region of cultural, natural, and historic beauty, and it's all there if you just get on a bike and look for the signs. Uh, thanks so much, because uh, even on a solo trip, one is really never alone. Uh, I want to thank just my ride buddies, uh, Washington State Parks and Ferry System, uh, the Montlake Bicycle Shop here in Seattle for always getting me rolling safely. Swift Industries, thanks so much for hosting this evening and for letting me tell my story. Uh, and I couldn't do it without the native peoples of the Coast Salish tribes stewards of this land and the water since time immemorial. Thanks again. I started talking. <laughs> no one can hear me. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks so much. That was great. There's a lot of people that I know don't live here in the chat that uh, we're pretty stoked to go to San Juan's. <clears throat> Does anyone have questions from the virtual world? Awesome. I definitely. Gonna... Jo Josie, you're right. Those aggressive raccoons are the worst. <laughs> There's one. Let's see if I can find it. There's a comment that I wanted to highlight here because I thought it was funny. Oh, yeah. This one. There we go. Shout out to your periodic table. Oh, yeah, props. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it takes a lot of chemistry to uh, enjoy it all, so it's good. Oh, steel is real. I'll say that. There's my chemistry bike joke. <laughs> uh, Martina, representing Swift Industries, is wondering if anybody hasn't been bike camping before and has any questions awesome about that don't be shy please don't be it's really easy to just go overnight um, i'm a big fan of the bike overnight program with the uh, adventure cycling association just getting out there um, as you can see so much of this was just from my home uh, i really was challenged i had ridden up in the san juans before and someone said but he, have you ever ridden to the san juans and all of a sudden that week-long trip where I meandered up north um, became a week-long trip getting there. Oh, great. I'll, I'll answer Rick's question. No mechanicals or flats. I've got uh, great bike mechanics in Seattle. I've got Schwalbe Marathon tires uh, and uh, 
some skills to put it together if I need to. But no, it's a really great bike. That salsa bike can go and go and go. Uh, Jason, do you want to moderate or just should I answer Zach's question? Yeah, go ahead. Awesome. Um, yes, um, traveling during COVID, I think, um, was a little bit nervy, but I spent the entire time outside. I was never inside the whole time. So even on the ferry, I just sat on the deck. I didn't even go anywhere. I just like sat with my bicycle. Most of the ferry crossings were about a half hour locally. And then the San Juan trip is a little bit longer, but it's gorgeous. So why not just sit out there, put on my windbreaker and suck it up, you know? I mean, soak it all in really. Um, yeah. Um, there's a gear question here. I know Jessica loves gear questions. <laughs> I don't know uh, about gear. I can do what did you use for your shelter? Awesome. Uh, I have a um, black diamond beta mid uh, with uh, my two trekking poles that are super light. So I strap those to the back of my um, bike rack. And then I have a, um, a bug like insert that goes with it because it's uh, the, be the, the beta mid is a floorless tent. Uh, and the nice thing about it, I don't even have to put the shelter on top, the fly, and I could just use the and bug mid underneath uh, on a really clear and beautiful day. Nice. Awesome. Um, Go for it, Jessica. Or you I just see Ian's, how far was my first ever bike overnight? Um, I think it was just across the sound, as I always say, just across the sound and thousands of miles away. Um, we're super blessed here in the Northwest to just grab a ferry um, and get to someplace uh, quickly. And so there's a 10 mile route um, that I do, uh, that it feels like I'm just camping on the beach, uh, which I am. And many of uh, the Northwest folks have been there as well. Um, and so that's great. Uh, I will say then I took my first sort of extended trip uh, all the way across to Canada. And so this two week one felt just joyously short, <laughs> if I should say. Awesome. Is there any, any more questions? Before we say goodnight to Jessica and bring on our next presenter. Um, oh, can I answer just one really briefly for my niece? Yeah. Um, uh, my my six-year-old niece, who's a hell of a cyclist herself, wants to know how heavy is all the gear that I carry on my bike. Um, this time I carried uh, more food than I had. That sort of that answers Zach's question about COVID as well. Um, I was eating out a lot less and just really enjoying cooking. Um, and so I think my rear pannier gear is maybe 30 pounds and my front pannier gear is about 10. I carry a full SLR camera with me in my front um uh, handlebar bag uh, and the bike itself is around 35. So maybe we're talking about 60 something rolling. And again, I'm not a gear guru, so I don't have it all measured. <laughs> it's just cool. Awesome. Um, all right. We're going to move on to the next presenter. Um, I know there was another question about food from Rachel Schwartz and I'm going to reserve that maybe for another presenter to, to address because, yeah, you know, food, bike camping food issues are pretty similar from trip to trip. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you all so very much. Cheers. Yeah. Okay. Next up we have another, these are all folks from Seattle, by the way, I'm really stoked that, um, I was able to ask some people if they'd like to present and, um, and then some other people are like, Oh, I want to do that. And it all just happened to be, um, like I said earlier, veterans of Stokes spoke, whether as participants presenting or as participants as an audience member. So this is really fun. Uh, next up we have Miss Becca book. Hi Becca. Um, I have a little intro for you, Becca. It's it's very short, and um, I, hope, I hope it's okay. Um, Becca, you are muted, just so you know. Um, Becca is an architect and an accomplished road and track racer. One of my highlights for 2020, no, 2020, um, happened when Becca and I both went to the Mid-South Race in Stillwater, Oklahoma, 
basically when yeah uh, yeah the world was ending in seattle as we knew it to be so um becca you're still muted Oh, I got gotcha. you. You're unmuted now. Oh, wait, you came back. Well, you're on. Um, All right. So that's Becca. Hi, Becca. Can you hi. hear us? My computer just almost crashed, but I'm back now. So <laughs> thank you. Awesome. For, uh, um, that wonderful introduction. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I see, okay. Cool. I'm going to bring your presentation in and then I will see you in a little bit. Thank you. Okay. So I think one second, we get the right screen up. Sorry, <laughs> my computer almost crashed there. So I need to make sure I have the right screen up for you. There we go. Thank you very much for that introduction. I just wanted to start out with thanking my parents who are joining as well. My dad is a great cyclist, despite what recent events may suggest, and um, definitely helped get me into cycling and my, brought me on many of my first trips my, with my mom as well. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about a trip I did with my partner, Brandon, featured here in this photo and probably in the back of my camera throughout this presentation as well. We traveled um, 460 miles through Cuba uh, last winter in December uh, 2019 and January 2020, back when the world was healed. Um, and this, this trip was done on the native lands of the Oroco Indians who were uh, almost completely wiped out by uh, the genocide impacted by uh, colonizers, but uh, it is important as ever to honor their past stewardship of the land of Cuba, Cuba and the, the cultural legacy they have left the island with even today. So for our, our adventure began before we even got to Cuba, we drove to Vancouver from Seattle, then flew to Mexico City, then flew into Havana, where it took us two days to acclimate, get our money changed, figure out what exactly was going on. Uh, and then we took a uh, Via Azul bus, which is one of the national bus, bus companies, to the southern coast of Cuba, to the city of Trinidad. When, from there, we uh, biked to, through the southern coast, the Valley of Vinales, and then up to Puerto Esperanza. And there's just a massive diversity in the landscapes that you see in that area. Um, Trinidad is a brightly colored city full of uh, painted townhomes. Um, Las Teresas is a uh, eco village up in the mountains that was started as a model village by um, the Castros. And then Puerto Esperanza is uh, just, just a few miles away from Miami, uh, but a world away. So once we got into to Trinidad after taking a bus across the country, we realized that there really are some huge disparities around the country. Uh, a huge amount of the local economy is driven by tourism. There's even a totally separate uh, currency that's just available for tourists to use, so it doesn't cost too much infl inflation and local costs. Um, and Trinidad is one of those places that the government has decided to invest in and make a tourist destination. And, uh, 
they they succeeded. It's it's beautiful, and a lot of the uh, folks from surrounding rural areas and villages come here to work. Uh, as lovely as it was, we were happy to get on the road, despite what my my face might say. Um, this is, I think, seven miles after we got out of town, went straight up. Uh, it was quite a climate shock leaving Seattle and going to Cuba in December. It was uh, between 85 and 95 the entire time we were there and very humid. Um, and as you can probably tell, I'm not, not really used to the heat, but uh, we, we made it through. Um, so throughout our trip, we were staying at these uh, Casa Familiares that basically translates to private rooms, but they are rooms in um, people's homes where they will make you food, share their room. It's a great way for local families to uh, make some extra money, and it's a really great way to meet people and sort of learn about what was going on. And this is the first place we stayed, and I think it was particularly important there. Um, Cheo here in the center uh, was extremely patient with the two months of Duolingo Spanish we showed up with and uh, really took the time to orient us and tell us what was going on. He even offered to sell us his beautiful Casa Familiar. So this is when we take a break from talking about the trip and invite you to our beautiful new mountain bike retreat. There is one trail and one cave. But unfortunately, we didn't, didn't have enough cash to to buy any property when we're in Cuba. So um, we'll have to go back to the journey. Uh, so this area is called the Sierra de Escambre. It's a bunch of limestone karst formations. So all of this was a uh, layered up limestone that got slowly eroded to reveal these amazing caves and, and formations in the landscape. And we traveled along that ridge. Uh, the area is distinguished by by these limestone formations and there's a lot of coffee growing in the area. You can see over here on the on the right, they're drying coffee just, just right on this patio. You just leave it out in the sun to have sun dried coffee. Um, we continued down out of the mountains to San Fuegos, uh, which is a larger city on this bay. And from San Fuegos, we took um, a small, rather rather slapped together ferry across the bay. Uh, there are probably a dozen boats on this little, a dozen bikes on this little boat. And uh, it goes by all these little villages where you can see people going out and fishing and uh, just living right on the waterfront here. Uh, this is our friend from the ferry. Once we got off the ferry, we were showing him our route, which was um, you know, largely adapted from the bikepacking.com uh, La Ruta Mala route. It's supposed to be an entirely dirt route. And he was basically just like, why would you take that road? There's a perfectly good highway over there. And, um, you know, we, we had a lot of people uh, ask us why we would be on these tiny little bumpy roads when we could just take this highway that they spent so much time and money building. Um, he had a really good point, but in this one situation, we managed to, to uh, slip off onto the little side road and uh, follow the coast. So this is where we were traveling. Um, it's not actually a dirt road. It is entirely coral, as you can see from the picture on the right, which makes for some pretty rough riding on your tires. I think Brandon had three uh, flats that day. This is also when we realized that they spray for mosquitoes across every city in Cuba. We didn't have really any problems with the mosquitoes in the, in the cities, but once you get out of that municipal boundary, you're kind of on your own and uh, really uh, started to notice that we were in a tropical environment with plenty of mosquitoes when we were fixing those flats. That, that day we went to the Bay of Pigs. Um, I did not really have a clear image of what I was expecting, but of course this is a place that I associate with military exercises and, you know, communist things, but it's a quiet little fishing village. Uh, lovely people here. We stayed at another Casa Familiar there. Um, and, the, you know, it's just a small little town with uh, 
incredibly friendly people who were so eager to sit down and suffer through our terrible Spanish and let us know about the area where they where they lived. Um, we had planned to continue uh, along the coast the next day. And then we realized that the coast was entirely marsh, which is something that was really driven home when we passed a few alligator farms that we thought we were gonna go right around the alligator farms. And we decided that maybe our friend from the ferry was right and we should stick to the highway for this day. Um, so it, it was again, hot. I didn't quite, decide to join these cows that were bathing in the mud, but it didn't look so disgusting at the time. I can tell you, it just seemed like a nice way to cool off. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here is almost all of the food in Cuba is produced on the island. So uh, there's huge government farms that we passed through this that day. This is in the province of Mayabec. And, uh, you know, just, just big, uh, pig farms, lots of sugar cane. Um, it's all managed by the government. Uh, that day we uh, finished in Grainis. This is not really somewhere we planned to stop. So uh, other days we had kind of like either found uh, Casa Familiar before we uh, left for the day. Uh, internet's not really widely available. Um, or we had gotten a recommendation of someone's cousin or someone's family member who we could stay with in the next town who also had a Casa Familiar. Uh, when we got to Grainis, we still had, had some thought that we could we could camp somewhere around there, but that's not really something people do in, in Cuba, so it's pretty hard to get directions to somewhere you could camp. Also, as I mentioned, it's pretty marshy uh, around the coast in this area, so we arrived in the town of Grainis just as the sun was setting and came into their village square. We figured we'd just ask around for a Casa Particular, but this is this is definitely off the tourist route. So uh, we had one friend who thought that he could uh, take us to someone else's house and they might be around and after like knocking on their windows and throwing st uh, a stone up at the upper story windows, didn't, didn't get their attention. And finally, we found these kids that were buying some Fanta at the butcher shop. And they were like, yeah, we can totally help you. And they laid us, laid, led us back through these winding roads into this little residential area. We were starting to get a little, little concerned. You know, what are we gonna, what are we gonna do? Where are these people taking us? And we realized that it was a, uh, it was a little love hotel that the teenagers used. Uh, and uh, they, the owner of the place was like, oh, you can rent this place overnight. Uh, they had, uh, you know all these uh, mirrors on the ceiling. They had whiskey that you could buy out of the fridge. It was basically set up for all the teenagers to come and bring their girlfriends and hang out. But the, the owner was really lovely and incredibly patient with us as we sort of unexpectedly stumbled into his home. Um, so we the next day we continued heading to the Northwest this is a little town of sort of Gendirio de Barbara. We went through a lot of little farming towns that day and it was just an incredibly different site than you would see if you were in Havana or Trinidad or any of the places that are normally mentioned in your Lonely Planet book. We had a Lonely Planet book and it pretty explicitly said, <laughs> don't bother going here. Um, but it was just fascinating to see Um, and after another day going through sort of the plains and the farmlands of Cuba's, we, we were heading back up into the mountains in the Sierra Rosario. Um, this is in the Artemisia forest province. And this whole area is uh, characterized by these, what they call cloud forests, which are basically rainforests, but they don't rain, which is something I think Seattle should really try out because it was great. You know, get all the lush vegetation, but don't have to worry about the rain all that much. Uh, Cafetal Buena Vista is, was, it's one of the oldest coffee plantations in Cuba, uh, was actually a French plantation. 
And then this whole area was chosen by the Castro regime for a model eco village and is now a UN biosphere. So it's just an incredibly diverse and rich wilderness. Um, and there's also uh, a village up on the hill where uh, you can't buy or sell any of the homes. It's passed, up, passed down through generations. It's a huge artist complex. It was a really lovely place to stop and have just all locally organic, grown organic food, which is most of the food in Cuba, but this was particularly good. Uh, so we did get a chance to, to do our gravel cycling. Uh, we were a little bit uh, off put by the rain that flooded some of the roads, but then we discovered we could go boulder cycling, which is even bigger than gravel cycling. Uh, coming down from the Sierra Rosario, we were going into the, the Valley of Vinales, which is a huge tobacco producing region. Um, we were, <laughs> We're stopped sort of on our way in by this this family. It was just like, well, we're gonna, you know, my dad's gonna show you how he he ro rolls cigars, and he took us into their home, and we're telling us all about uh, their history and uh, their daughter, their history in the tobacco industry, and their daughter who just turned sixteen, and uh, showing us her um, uh, quinceanera photos from the year before, and um, it was just a a really lovely interaction and also quite good cigars. Um, this on the, the right is the barn where you cure the tobacco leaves. This is actually in a uh, national park that where you can uh, grow tobacco if you give 90% of it to the Cuban government, uh, but then you get the land for free and you're required to follow organic practices. And there's a baby goat. So this is Vinales, again, this just really dramatic limestone formations. Uh, it's this the whole valley is like this. Um, they're called magotes, and they're, there's just dozens of them, extremely popular with rock climbers, too. Uh, Vinales was lovely, very beautiful, but <laughs> incredibly touristy, which was a bit of a shock coming out of, you know, staying in love hotels off of a farm road. So uh, we traveled up to Puerto Esperanza and we're really happy to just get back to the small villages where people were really interested in talking to us and patient enough to deal with our uh, disorientation and poor Spanish. Uh, we met Ernesto because he had the newest bike we had seen in all of Cuba. Uh, he <laughs> uh, he came up and told us he liked his bikes. Our, he liked our bikes, and he had been involved with the National University of Sport in Cuba, trying to help get bikes for kids there to learn how to race. Um, and he ended up taking us to his sister's place to have hand caught lobster, uh, and telling us all about how difficult it was to get anything from a tire. He gave us a friend's phone number in the Dominican Republic and asked us to send tires to him. Here he is showing off his angle grinder, which is what he used to work on to repair people's bikes in the area. He was just a lovely person. Um, after we had lunch at his sister's, uh, Casa Familiar, he took us back for, um, for coffee. We, we went for one last snorkel off the northern coast and ended up leaving our snorkeling equipment with him so he could keep going lobster fishing. Uh, so after that, we got a bus, went another Via Azul bus back up to Havana and spent two days looking around the area. This was one of the highlights of the sort of touristy side of the trip for me. Um, Jose Fuster is a... Cuban artist, as you can probably guess, he does mosaics. This is his home. Uh, it's a huge complex, just completely covered with these hand-fired tiles. Some of them have paintings on them. Um, and I am an architect and I have no idea how he gets concrete to do these things. Uh, so it was a, this was a great stop for us. Um, sort of wrapping up with one of my favorite mosaics from Pusterlandia of Fidel and Che on this communist love boat heading off into the sunset. 
And I wanted to spend a few moments talking about logistics for the trip. One of the things people have questions about is how do you get a visa to, to, to Cuba? Um, the, there used to be 13 or 15 ways to get a visa in the Obama era. Trump took out two of those ways. So now the only sort of viable option to go there as a vacation is something that's called support for the Cuban people. Um, the limitations of that visa are basically that you're not allowed to spend money at government businesses, which is a lot of them. Uh, it's a lot of hotels. It's a lot of, uh, I mean, like the water and, Coca and cola companies are owned by the government. So you might slip a little bit for sure. Uh, but one of the main things is it staying in Casa Particulares and other places where you can help Cubans get money from Americans. Um, we weren't entirely sure we were there legally and for most of the trip because we never submitted something saying that we were there on a support for the Cuban people visa. And then we ran into some Americans randomly in the mountains uh, who were like, oh, no, that's it. You just declare declare to the heavens that you are here to support the Cuban people. Um, so one thing they suggested is that we keep track of where we spent money and where we stay each night and that that would provide the necessary documentation that we were meeting the terms of this visa. Uh, I will say we drove back in through Canada with several bottles of Cuban rum and several boxes of cigars and we told them that and they were incredibly bored when they heard it. I thought it would be a bigger issue and it was not. Uh, money. You cannot take money out of an American bank account in Cuba. And if you have American dollars, there is an extra fee to convert them into Cuban dollars. So that means you have to have all of your money in cash. Um, it was convenient for us going through Vancouver because we could just take out cash there. But we still just had a lot of cash that we were carrying on us, which is kind of terrifying. So uh, some of the ways we dealt with that is booking accommodations that we thought we could make on time uh, advance through Airbnb and through storing some cash at the first class of particulars we stayed in Havana. Uh, basically, don't drink the water. We used UV water filters for the entire time we were there. They're light and easy and you don't look too weird if you're doing it at a little roadside cafe. Um, food. The food was great. We were both vegetarian and it's a little bit awkward to show up in a country that had food rationing as recently as the mid 90s and say that you have dietary restrictions. So I think we were very aware of um, not being too entitled to our veggie burgers when we showed up. Uh, we ended up eating a lot of eggs and a lot of just some of the most freshest fruit I've ever had. Um, this is breakfast at one of our Casa Particulares. Uh, that's another great place to get home cooked meals. Um, as I mentioned, all the food is made there, or grown there. Um, there's huge tracts of government farms. Uh, you can also get a certified background backyard farm. There is a government department of backyard farms and uh, the fruit from the meal on the right was almost entirely grown in the backyard of one of the places we were staying. Um, if you're Cuban, you can go to a bodega and get food with your rations. Otherwise, you can wait in this line uh, and you can get food from the grocery store. Uh, so eating at our casas was a great way to deal with both of those things. We did bring a lot of snacks because there's not a huge variety of prepackaged food there. So we brought a lot of a lot of cliff bars maybe the only situation in which I would recommend eating a lot of clip bars. Um, the other place that was great is there's just so many roadside stands. Um, you know, it's a great climate, at least in, in December, to be outside drinking, drinking some rum and a coconut. And um, we found a lot of options there, especially if you wanted these tostones, these smash fried plantains, or I think the other order that we got is plantain chips. <laughs> Um, 
So there is internet in Cuba. You need to have a government issued internet card, which you buy for an hour and then you enter this code. Um, you can, they're, pre, they're very cheap if you go to the government store and wait in the line, or there's just dozens of people that would love to sell internet cards at a markup to tourists. And we found that to be incredibly convenient and really not that expensive. Or you can go to this guy in Trinidad, uh, Luis claims he's, he's uh, on par with Google and he was, he was pretty convincing. You just tell him where he's from and he'll just spurt off facts of uh, everything he knows about Seattle or America. And then just a brief second to talk about our gear. Um, I have a bunch of the Ovea Negra ba bags, which I really like. We brought our tent and our sleeping bags and we never used them because <laughs> camping's not really a thing there. And it's probably good we didn't try to camp because we later found out you were supposed to kind of have a place that you were staying and helping Cuban people every, every night. Um, the UV water filter is something we used every day. You need these bigger water bottles, uh, like the Nalgene ones, the liter size Nalgene ones to use those. Um, and then just be sure to bring any spare parts you think you, you need because no one's going to phone your friend from the Dominican Republic and get you a tire if you if you get a flat. So um, I was very happy to have tubeless tires. Brandon just made sure to bring a lot of extra tubes. Uh, and then while we take questions, I figured I'd just leave up this slide of all these dogs that we met along the way. So that's the end of my presentation. That's great, Becca. <laughs> Thank you for that. <clears throat> Street dogs are always a gem. <laughs> um, well, our first question is, from someone wondering uh, what, how you transported your, I think they're asking how you transported your bikes. Did you box them? Did you use a travel case? If you use the travel case or a box, did you store it somewhere? Or did you get a new one? I have a Pika Packworks um, bike bag that I've had for like six or seven years now that's been great um, it's pretty bulky we left it at our first casa familia in havana um, we knew we were going to come back there uh, that's something that we we worked out before we left the country um, so we uh, found some place you can book them on airbnb and let them know that we wanted to leave stuff there and that was great because we left some cash in our bags too and um <laughs> the I, I can't overemphasize how terrifying it is to have all the money that you need to leave like in your pocket. So it was great to know that we had some, some backup plan back in Havana. Hmm. Brandon is commenting about how you used, what, the leaners from your bags? What is this? Can you explain this, Becca? Oh, <laughs> this is my partner. <laughs> He's in the other room. <laughs> so um, <laughs> when we were at the Love Hotel in Greenness, uh, we had, it was the one time we used our sleeping bags. And because <laughs> uh, we were like, we don't know where these sheets have been, we slept in our sleeping bags that night. <laughs> And I would also like to speak about the hairless dachshunds. Um, we looked at the name. I think it's actually a Mexican breed. These are one of the few like pet indoor dogs we saw. Like a lot of people have farm dogs or hunting dogs. And obviously there's dogs on the street. But these are like the pure, it's like the Labradoodle of Cuba. <laughs> these, uh, I wish I, I could remember the name. Um, But uh, that's that's all I know about them is that they naturally have a mohawk and that there are a lot of them in Cuba. Uh, there is a question about whether or not you saw many other cyclists or adventurers while you were there. Yeah, so um, we are the only ones that can't go to Cuba. 
lots of people from Europe go and vacation in Cuba. Uh, it's big, big with Russians um, and Germans, and Germans love to cycle. So we met four groups of Germans on the road doing various types of cycle adventures. Um, there was a couple who was sort of just bare bones backpacking it, stopping at Casa Particulares. There was a two older men that were basically like going full, full bro time without the wives for like two months or something. Um, and cycling is just a really common way of getting around Cuba because you can't get gas there. So um, there's just lots of people carrying heavy loads on their bikes on the road. Um, vaccines or meds? Um, no, we did not. There is not uh, malaria in Cuba. Um, and the cost, we paid um, ten, around $10 a night with breakfast at the Casa Particular. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, the Casa Particulars were around $10 a night, including breakfast. It varies wildly based on when, wh where you are. So if you're in a touristy place like in Havana, um, there was one night where we did not plan ahead for lodging and ended up paying, um, I think, $70 a night, which was a lot there. But most of the time we were playing around $10 with breakfast. Um, as I mentioned, there's two different currencies in Cuba. Uh, so there's the Cuban convertible peso, which is for people visiting. And then there's the national money, which is what you get paid in if you work for the Cuban government. And so um, once you get out of touristy places and the prices are a national money, they're perfectly happy to have your other currency. Um, but everything's like a 30th of the cost. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Becca. Awesome. I think we're going to wrap this one up and move on to our next presenter. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye. All right. Up next, we have none other than Marley Blonsky. Look at those. You put on new glasses. I didn't even notice that. And they match your shirt. That's amazing. You're muted. I think I have to unmute you. All right. There we go. Can you hear me? All right. I can hear you. I hope everyone else can hear you. I'm going to do my introduction. Okay. And then the stage will be yours. All right. So this is Marley Blonsky, another Seattle resident. Uh, Marley is a bike explorer, a new dog mom of two, I believe. Um, yeah, that's true. Uh, she's been a lifelong, or at least adult life, cycling advocate, um, specifically bent on getting the bike industry to pay attention and be more inclusionary, especially for folks that are not fitting what would be the norm, right? Yeah. Cool. Great intro. Thank and you. I said it earlier better. So anyways, um, let's see. We'll bring Marley's presentation in here and I'm going to leave. Oh man, I wish you could oh. see my bottom part. How do I fix <laughs> Maybe I should work on my phrasing. Anyway. <laughs> Well, there we go. We'll, we'll figure it out someday. I think we figured it All out. All right. We'll see um, you in a little bit. Great. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Carly. Um, so, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm not going to apologize for my extra outfit because um, it's COVID and I bought this dress in March and I'm wearing it every chance I can. Um, so, I totally understand why the roaring, the roaring 20s were a thing because I just wanna be around people. And if I can't, I'm gonna be really extra. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you tonight about this trip that I went on last summer um, on the Corvallis to Coast Trail. 
Um, it's not nearly as epic as the first two trips that we heard about tonight. Um, as you'll hear, it was a two day trip, so fairly short, um, fairly shortened distance as well. Um, but it was really challenging. Um, so that's why I've named my presentation Cursing the Corvallis to Coast Trail. So let's dive in. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, Jason gave a great intro, um, but like he said, I'm a Seattle-based bike adventurer. Um, I identify as a fat woman. Um, if you guys have seen me present before, I think this is my third or fourth time presenting at Stokes Folk, um, but I also do other things. Um, I don't think fat is a bad word. It's just like a descriptor I use. Um, also new this year, which is really exciting. Um, I'm a Pearl Azumi ambassador and official Shimano ambassador, um, which will tie into this presentation and I'll explain that. Um, I also do public speaking, community organizing, um, I do workshops, um, and I do writing and advocacy on size, inclusivity, and body positivity. Um, so if something I say um, resonates with you tonight, um, feel free to get in touch. Um, and I would love to you know, talk to your um, community group or your workspace um, or whoever about um, being more inclusive and diverse and uh, whatnot, specifically about um, body size. I'm obviously a white woman, so I'm not gonna even get into that area. Um, but I really approach cycling with um, the mantra of all bodies are good bodies, um, all bike rides are, or all bikes are good bikes, and all rides should be celebrated, uh, regardless of how short or long or epic or not epic. Um, so, some important stuff about this um, ride that I'm going to tell you about. Um, it was sponsored, and I feel really weird saying that because I've never gone on a sponsored ride before, um, but I actually made money to go bikepacking, um, which feels wild, and I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, but this trip I'm going to tell you about was filmed. Um, we were followed by a film crew, um, and Shimano uh, sponsored us. Um, we are also provided clothes by Pearl Azumi, helmets by Laser, um, and then it was supported by Velo Orange, who gave me the bike, which I'll tell you guys all about the bike. It's a really, really rad bike. Um, and then Sweetgrass Productions was the film crew, um, and they provided, uh, they were the sag wagon, um, unintentionally or not, but by following us along, they were the sag wagon. Um, also, as Jason talked about at the beginning, um, acknowledging the indigenous lands um, that we traveled on, and I guess Becca and Jessica did too. Um, so I'm coming to you from Seattle um, on the Duwamish lands, but um, this trip was from Corvallis to the Oregon coast, um, and we were really lucky to travel through um, a bunch of different indigenous lands. Um, and so, you know, when you're traveling through um, or bikepacking, um, I think it's really important to acknowledge um, who the the stewards and the indigenous folks who um, who resided on that land was. Um, I've also thrown um, Kaylee, who actually I don't want to say she designed this route, but she orchestrated this route, um, and so that's her her Instagram handle. So if you guys want to go check her out, um, she's doing some really rad stuff within this space as well. So let's dig in. So the C to C trail, um, it is an actual route um, that has real information out there. Um, so if anything I say tonight resonates with you and you're like, yeah, that seems like a cool trip, um, go look it up um, because my word is not like the ultimate like end word on this. Um, but basically it's a non-motorized trail or it's a trail that connects for non-motorized users from the Willamette Valley in um, Corvallis, Oregon, to the Pacific Ocean. So it's open to hikers, bikers, um, equestrian use, um, and technically, I guess cars can go on most of it, um, but there definitely are some parts where um, it is for non-motorized use only. A um, Couple really important notes. Um, the folks who have put together this trail have worked really hard with the landowners, um, both like private landowners and the logging companies who own the, um, the land rights. Um, so there's camping is only allowed at the approved campgrounds. Like as you're going through, um, the route is signed really, really well, um, but you'll see signs throughout that have like the no camping sign. Um, so please, if you do this route, like just abide by um, the rules that they've put out there. Um, that includes no fires, um, except at the approved campground locations. Um, it is a high wildfire, high wildfire risk area. Um, and actually, 
this route was closed for a couple weeks this year because of wildfires. Um, it's also black bear and cougar country, so just something to be aware of when you're riding. Um, that's something you know everywhere here in the Northwest. Um, and there's also a limited water supply. Um, so make sure you bring as much water as you think you'll need and filtration. Um, I, I can't speak a lot to that um, in total transparency because we did have the sag wagon um, that had water. Um, so I, I don't actually know the availability of water, um, but bring water. When I was doing the research for this presentation, the C to C trail group recommends um, bringing lots of water. All right, so more details. Um, so the actual trip that we went on, uh, we did 65 miles. Um, about 30% of that was pavement, uh, about 65% of it was gravel, and about 5% of that was single track. Um, about 6,500 feet of elevation gain, I don't know exactly. Um, I tried to do it on Strava, um, but on day two, the camera crew that was in the van had my phone um, because on day one, they kept losing us. Um, so on day two, they needed the GPS track um, to know where we were going. Um, so um, they didn't keep Strava running. Anyway, long story. I don't know what we climbed, but it was hard and long and hilly and we'll get there. A um, couple other important points. Um, there are zero resupply points on this route. Um, so make sure you take whatever food you need. Um, basically you start out in Corvallis and then you go through this tiny little town um, called Philomath. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Sorry to anybody who lives there. Um, and that's like your last chance to get stuff um, before you get to the coast. Um, there's one campground um, like smack dab in the middle of the trip. Um, and we did this in two days of travel. Um, it's 65 miles. Um, probably if you're in good shape or better shape than me, you could do this as a day ride. Um, but we did it in two days of travel. And then we got a ride in a car back to Corvallis. Um, I know there's other folks who either take the bus back or, um, you know, incorporate this into other routes. Um, it's kind of a choose your own adventure type of thing. Um, so those are the details. Um, so like I said, Kaylee kind of orchestrated and designed this route. And if you've seen me present before, or if you've ever traveled with me, you know that I'm really in it for, um, the journey and for, um, having fun and taking breaks and just having a good time. Um, so when she designed this, she said, oh, it's just one big climb. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm in it for that. And I thought she meant like, oh, it's like one big climb, like Vashon Island, where it's like, you know, a mile or two climb. And then the rest of the day is like rolling hills and fun. And no, <laughs> we literally climbed all day long. And it was uh, challenging. Uh, is the nicest way to say it. Um, there were um, definitely times throughout the day where I was like questioning my willingness to be on this ride. Um, you know, the ride was only 33 miles for that day, but it was really, really hot, really, really hard. Um, and to, you know, add another element to it, we had a camera crew there filming us. So it's like I had to keep this positive face on because the whole idea was to show that bikepacking is fun. We want people to do this. And I was like hating a lot of it. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a picture of uh, me dying on the side of the road. Um, I really actually love this picture because it shows the bike from Velo Orange and all the fancy Shimano parts. Um, but also just like, you know, sometimes bikepacking doesn't go the way that you want it to. And that's okay. Um, one thing that I like kept reminding myself throughout this ride is like, there's no trophies in bikepacking. Um, you know, you're out there for the experience, you're out there to have fun. Um, and so to make of that what you will. And so I guess one of the things that I want to talk about with this is like, how do I um, get past that mental block? Um, I get this question a lot from people of like, you know, how do you do it when the hills are really hard or when it's really hot or whatever. So these are some of the techniques that I used on this trip and on other trips. Um, although admittedly, I typically don't plan trips that are like outside of my comfort zone. Um, but this was a great learning experience for me. Um, so I play a game called One Tree at a Time. 
um, where I like pick out a tree 10 or 20 feet in front of me and like just pedal until I can get there. And then I pick out another tree 10 or 20 feet ahead. And typically, you know, if there's a really hard part of the climb or, um, you know, a section that I just am having struggling to get through, that'll get me through it. Just like, you know, one tree at a time. Um, sometimes I do this for Seattle folk going up stone way, like one light pole at a time. Um, and that works. Um, I also, I love snack breaks. Um, you know, taking a lot of snacks on my bike. I, here's my bike right here. And I use this part right here. I don't know what it's supposed to be used for, but I use it as my snack pouch. Um, on my other bike, I, you know, whatever bike I'm on, I always have easily accessible snacks. Um, and typically, you know, I've got either a road soda or other um, snackable items, we'll say, in there. And it was interesting on this trip because um, typically I'm on my own schedule. You know, I'm either by myself or with buddies and we do our own thing. It's like, cool, if we make it to camp, great. If not, we find a closer campground. Um, but on this trip, we were really dictated by the fact that there was one campground and we were on the camera crew schedule. Like they needed, we were racing daylight and they had specific shots they needed to get. Um, so I wasn't able to just like take a snack break whenever I wanted to, which was really, really interesting. Um, and then finally, like accepting your limit. Um, if you notice in this picture right here, I'm not on my bike. Um, I am definitely in a car. That's a seatbelt right there. Um, so like my asthma was acting up. It was really, really hot. Um, and I just kind of hit a wall where I was like, I can't ride my bike anymore. Um, and so Zeppelin, who was the director, uh, he rode my bike for probably five minutes. It wasn't very long. I was able to get in the car, cool down, take a break. Um, so just knowing your limit. And, you know, I think if the sag wagon wouldn't have been there, um, and I would have been on my own or just me and Kaylee, I would have just stopped and, you know, calmed down, um, taken the time I needed to regroup and, um, and gone on from there. Um, but I don't think there's any shame in either, you know, walking up the hill. Um, when you guys see the film, um, you'll see there's a lot of walking. Um, and just knowing when you've hit your limit. Um, you know, other things I do, you can see the speaker here. I, I listen to a lot of upbeat music or podcasts. Uh, I used to listen to true crime podcasts. And then I realized that like listening to stories about men murdering women in the woods while I'm a woman traveling through the woods, not so cool. Um, so I stopped doing that. And now I listen to upbeat things. Um, but I'd be curious to know, you know, if you guys have other techniques for when the ride just really sucks, um, how do you get through it? Cause, um, sometimes that happens. Um, so, uh, day two, so we made it to camp. Everything was fine. Um, I unfortunately don't have many photos of camp. Um, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I don't have a lot of great photos. Um, but day two, um, was only two climbs. So <laughs> you can see the elevation profile here. Um, we basically went over like two small, um, mountain ranges for this. Um, 32 miles, so really doable in terms of um, distance-wise. Um, and um, funny story from from day two, um, we went through a lot of like farm country here and um, just like nice gravel rural roads. Um, but there was where this picture was taken. There was a little farm over here to the left, and um, there was you know some donkeys and horses. And Kaylee and I stopped to like you know, talk to the horses or something. Um, and this woman came out and she was like, Hey, are you guys okay? There's like a white van following you. And <laughs> we had to explain to her that like, Oh no, we're actually with those guys. And like, we're making this film. It's fine. And she was like, okay. Cause like, if they're causing you problems, like we can do something about that. Um, so it was really sweet to know that like folks were out there looking out for us. Um, but anyway, um, day two ends at the Pacific Ocean, which is really, really awesome. And you can see, you know, after about mile 15, which is halfway through the day, um, it's basically all flat or downhill. Um, and then after about whatever this is, mile 20-ish, um, it's pavement. Um, and it's a really, really phenomenal ride. Um, so I know I kind of complained about the climb, uh, but if you like climbing um, and you like gravel and the ocean, this is definitely a great ride. Um, so a couple more things. If you go, um, I would recommend a gravel bike 
um, just because of the variation in terrain, um, because pavement, gravel, single track, having something that can really navigate all of those well um, is pretty essential. Um, tires, I'd say bigger than 32 millimeter. Um, I was on Thunderbirds um, and um, I was on tubeless setup, which worked out really, really well. Uh, there is some really chunky gravel on some of the descents. And so I was able to fly down those and it was so fun. And um, I really want to redo this route just for the descents. Uh, <laughs> we'll see if that happens. But um, this route is cool because um, it can be ridden year round. Um, it can be closed for fire season, depending on what happens. Like I said, two weeks after we went, um, uh, it was closed for fires. Um, there is one section that requires a permit. Um, in the map that I showed earlier, there is a detour that takes you um, away from the permitted section, but the permit is free. So um, I would say if you're interested in this route, just do some research and you can figure out if you need the permit or not. Um, and then just, you know, remember to bring all your food and water filtration stuff, because once you're on the route, there's really no place to restock. Um, so then just a little bit more uh, sneak peek behind the scenes. Um, you know, I thought we were going bikepacking and they were filming us and we were really um, making a film and bikepacking was part of it. Um, and you guys will see that when the film comes out, um, I have more details on that. Um, but it was definitely a great learning experience for me. Uh, the film crew was phenomenal and um, just really, really excited to kind of show the world what we put together. Um, so just a huge thank you to Shimano for funding this for us. Um, Sweetgrass Productions, who was the film guys, um, you know, it was funny because we went swimming in the Pacific Ocean with our bikes. Don't worry, we washed them, um, got all that corrosive, salt water off um, and Zeppelin for bringing our vision to life. Um, and, you know, with that, um, it's kind of the end, but the film is called All Bodies on Bikes. Um, it really um, gets into more of the um, emotional and interpersonal part of being a fat woman on a bicycle and kind of the journey with that. Um, and it'll be released on March, woo, on March 22nd. Um, so with that, that is my trip, and I'm going to stop there and uh, take questions. You're on mute. Damn it. <laughs> Thank you, Marley. That was awesome. <laughs> um, so if anybody has questions, pop them in the chat. That'd be rad. Um, one per Adam Robbins said that you pronounced... Philomath correctly. Philomath correctly. So Wonderful. that's great. That's Thank awesome. You. Um, also, Brittany reminds us that there are no trophies in backpacking, which um, I just want to point out that even though Marley was in a car, you know, she mentioned that if she was having a struggling moment, you just you just stop. Exactly. And, and chill out. You find some shade. You eat some snacks. It's really all about eating just snacks. Yeah. When you're struggling. If, if the car right. wouldn't have been there, I would have stopped and like drank a beer and hung out. And unfortunately we were on the time schedule of this camera crew and the film. Um, so I didn't get to hang out as long as I wanted, but yeah, you do what you got to do. Um, what was the daily elevation? Um, I think every day, each day was like between 2,500 and 3000 feet. Um, I don't know for sure. Um, there's a couple, when I looked at the, like the official profile, there's a bunch of different ways you can take. There's like, um, there's a trail you can take, there's a road, there's a gravel road. Um, so I don't know exactly what we did because I don't ride with a cycling computer. Um, maybe one day I will, but I don't know. I just started using Zwift and learned about Watts. So maybe a cycling computer is next. <laughs> Um, how do you see the film? Um, the film is coming out March 22nd. It'll come out on YouTube. Um, I don't want to be that person, but follow me on Instagram and I'll post incessantly about it. Um. Yeah. And, and on the Swift industry side, we'll, I'll try and add those links to the show notes that you can find below. Um, I'm not a YouTuber, so this is all new <laughs> below show notes, but also in our Swift Industries blog, we'll, we'll try and add that 
uh, once Marley has confirmation that Shimano gives their blessing. Yes. Um, um, Casey asked, when did you do this ride? So we did this ride at the end of July um, of this year, actually, or I guess previous year. Um, so we all quarantined before, got tested, um, did it under, I guess, COVID protocols or what was the recommendation at the time. Um, and you'll see in the film, we actually came up to Seattle and did kind of a group ride and we were all wearing masks. Um, so, yeah. Um, tell us a bit about sponsorships. Um, I don't know what there is to say about that. Um, you know, Velo Orange provided the bicycle. Thank you so much, Velo Orange. Um, Shimano provided all the parts. Um, uh, Pearl Izumi provided the clothes for us. You can see our cute little butts there in the Pearl Izumi bibs, which also work well as swimsuits, it turns out. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's a new world for me and I am learning all about it. I hope I'm not saying anything wrong right now. I will find out tomorrow. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a brand new world for me and I'm trying to be as authentic as possible within that. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah, you're welcome, Marley. Thank you. All right, um, how do I stop sharing? Um, I think I just have to turn you off here. Bye. <laughs> Okay. All right. Up next, we have our final presentation for the evening. And we had a, a last minute addition to this, what was going to be a duo, and now it's a trio. So let me bring these fellows in. Howdy, howdy. So we've got. We've got Miles Boucher, Ben Rainbow, and Mike. I don't know Mike, so <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize, Mike. We bumped into each other a couple times, but it's okay. okay. Cool. <laughs> um, but anyways, so let me do my little intro. Uh, so Miles and Ben, I know the the best here. So Miles is a clean water advocate. And he's the kind of cyclist that likes type two fun, as far as I can tell. Um, but we'll see from the presentation. I don't know. Uh, but I have had the pleasure of riding all over the Puget Sound region with Miles with kegs of beer in tow, which while casual, it's not so casual because it's, you know. Requires focus. Yeah, uh, and like kegs weigh a lot because it's a lot of water. Good payout. Though. And yeah, payout. yeah, good payout. Um, so that's fun. Ben is also prone to the suffer fest, but always keeps his stoke high. I've ridden with Ben a lot. Uh, he is a bike shop owner here in Seattle. His shop is right around the corner from Swift Industries Back Alley Bicycle, or I'm sorry, Ben, Back Alley Bikes. <laughs> um, and Mike, as far as I can tell, is the linchpin in this whole adventure. <laughs> he is, he is, he's like a pivotal, pivotal point in this, this journey. So exactly. I'm going to dip out. Right. I've, I've never shared a presentation and had three people in here. So we're going to see how this goes, but I'm going to disappear myself and y'all there he goes. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate Thank it, Jason. you, Swift Industries. Um, so, as Jason said, um, we are Ben, Mike, and Miles. Uh, we're going to tell you about a little trip that we took in the summer of 2019, um, which was called Howl with the Moon. It was a PDW, excuse me, PNW convergence ride, uh, original route, cobbled together by Ben Rainbow uh, and then ridden with uh, a group of whole new friends. So we're going to talk a little bit about our route, inspiration for it, the riders, um, and talk about some of the challenges we had, uh, the highlights, and of course, um, some things we learned along the way. Um, so this route was put together and uh, written for the 2019 edition of the Swift Tampa, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, and I guess we'll just dive right in. So this is summertime, uh, June, mid-June 2019. Uh, here's a brief overview of the profile. Um, 
some numbers if you're interested. We decided to tackle it in, in three days, um, but this was definitely a ride that was number second and was all the little experiences along the way that really made it what it was. Um, as I mentioned, Ben put the rep together and got a bunch of um, awesome folks together to do the ride. Um, and his inspiration for it was um, the explosion of Mount St. Helens, the volcano that erupted uh, in 1980. Um, ben, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, right, we were all, uh, we're all about, at that time, kind of looking forward to uh, some a large kind of an anniversary of the eruption. And uh, so that was exciting. In fact, um, I got to, we got to give credit where credit is due. Um, I had taken a trip down to Portland to go visit our friends at Golden Plier, um, Kevin and Becky. And, you know, drinking beers, you know, things happen and some wonderful things and things like, uh, hey, we should ride bikes together. Wouldn't that be fun and cool? And one of the ideas was to use the I-5 corridor and come up with some sort of route that we could come together uh, via train. Train was the thing that we came up with. It was like we could all train into a place and then go on the ride together and... Um, and then and then go our separate ways. The you know what's in between Portland and Seattle, and you know our friends um, Adam Hale and, and the Deschutes Cycleries in Olympia. He came out. He, he rode out there and showed up on I don't know the middle of the morning on day two. Um, but uh, the the volcano became kind of like the central figure and the inspiration because it does have uh, an epic, truly spectacular, um, one of a kind sense of place. Um, and to do and experience that with like a caboodle of like-minded folks who knew it was going to get weird and who were, were like down with that. Um, and to also kind of test ourselves with some mileage logistics, uh, it kind of had the right ingredients, not to, not, you know, like a perfect storm or anything, but like a, like a real good time. <laughs> Um, so, Mike, how did you get roped into this whole group here? Because we were all, yeah, uh, I knew Ben incidentally, but you and I met, I think, like, you know, that, that one day. Hour. Yeah, we met in the, I met almost everyone for the first time that day, except for Ben. Um, I think I was invited kind of last minute and like scrambled to get my setup together, get my mind prepped, and it sounded like an insanely good time. So, I think I took a day off work and just went for it and super, super thankful that I did. It's a trip I still think about very frequently. So thank you, Ben, for the invite. And to anyone watching, if you do get a last minute invite to go on a trip, just make it happen. You know, it's it's very worth it, I would say. I think four out of or maybe five people out of this trip uh, signed up like in the last week leading up to that sort of camp out. <laughs> where other plans had fallen apart and there were no plans. And Ben was like, hey, we're going to go ride mountains. Like, get there how you can. And, and so we did. Sure, right. And there's a there's a, a whole host of logistics, you know, not least of which is, is your bike ready? Um, and do you have the time or space to do it? Is like, can, can I do this? And a few of the folks, you know, had been involved in the chatter leading up to it. So like, you know, whatever, base miles or, or, or shakedown, you know, these, these terms that get batted around in terms of preparedness. Um, and it's a hard, I, I, I think as, as kind of a route maker or like a wild hair, it's, you know, I don't want to, I didn't want to put anybody into a compromising situation or so, so Katie and I, my partner, Katie seen there, um, we did some scouting in advance. There were some, some dark areas on the heat map where we had scouted out in advance. And in fact, that's how it really kind of came together. It's like, this is doable. This can, uh, and, and then, you know, everybody here is, 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 is kind of hand chosen for what they've contributed to their um, communities and to their, their, their spheres. Um, and that, you know, put me at ease. Like, hey, you know, we're, we're gonna go 200 miles. We'll see what happens. And uh, yeah, this, this this picture here was was, uh, was taken as as we kind of just like creeped onto the the blast zone. Um, 
Yeah. So. Yeah, we'll we'll dig into that here in just a second. Sorry about the uh, the feedback on my mic. I'm going to try to speak up, so maybe I'll end up yelling by the end of this. Um. So we've talked a little bit about who we are, who the group is. Um, we're going to talk about place a little bit. Um, there's a lovely little zone in the northwest corner of the United States, um, north of the Columbia River Valley, kind of nestled in the middle of the Cascade Mountains and south of the Salish Sea, um, historical and contemporary lands of Calus, Chehalis, Coastal Salish, Nisqually, and Confederated tribes of the Grand Ronde. Um, and that was an area that, as Ben mentioned, we kind of converged upon from north and south via train along the I-5 corridor um, and found ourselves in an area um, the Gifford Pinchot Forest is, is one name for it. Um, Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument is another name. Um, but we found it to just be a, uh, a thrilling natural adventure spot to kind of um, throw ourselves in, into this big challenge. So uh, as Mike mentioned, we kind of, some of us met that day on the platform of the Amtrak Kelso uh, Kelso Longview Station. Um, we, some of us were coming out of the northbound or the southbound train, some out of the northbound train. Ben came up, you know, and rolled up in the car, I think, having missed a train. They drove, jumped on the train, and then got on. Anyway, we all arrived somehow, some way, got some burritos, threw them in the bags, um, and, and set off. Our first stop was to be just off the side of Forest Service Road 83 um, at this first campsite within the um, approved zone. Uh, early the next morning, we would wake up and, as Ben mentioned, uh, from that photo op, traverse the eastern flank of uh, the Mountain Lewitt, Mount St. Helens, across the plains of Abraham, um, and then around through the blast zone, and then descend uh, to our camp for that night along the Green River Trail at the base of Vanson Peak, which would be our objective for the next morning, uh, which would get us up and out back into the River Valley where we could make it to the Centralia Amtrak station and hopefully catch our respective trains back north and south. Um, so we're gonna just talk through a few of the photos from the ride um, and some things we experienced along the way. So we started riding pretty late in the day um, and it very quickly got dark. Um, then Mike, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about just kind of what the vibe was as we started rolling out, not really knowing where we were going. Yeah, that uh, it was the you know one of the, the the concepts was like, hey, let's all meet uh, for uh, you know after 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 work or whenever we could all arrange in Kelso, and then we'll go have a happy hour at you know a view spot for the the, the volcano. Um, well, things kind of got pushed back. Yeah, there was like massive. I don't know backups and stuff on the way. So the trains were kind of backed up and, and then we, we finally got rolling. Um, yeah, we, that first night, yeah, we pushed on until about one o'clock in the morning, which is great. Everybody in the crew, I think that's right. Uh, we, we all had lights, we all mm -hmm. had high spirits and, you know, that sort of camaraderie and the anticipation was kind of the fuel that took us into the night. Uh, it was mostly pavement heading um, along the was it the Lewis River and the Swift Reservoir, um, and it was you know as as per our our topographic little slide there, it wasn't entirely a challenging ride. It was just like ramping up the expectation. Um, the idea being okay, we'll have a little happy hour, a little mingler, let's get weird, and then we can uh, we'll we'll wake up in the presence of the volcano. And it'd just be awesome. Instead of like seeing it kind of like slowly reveal itself, it's like it'll be there at night, and then we'll we'll wake up and it'll be like bam. That's kind of fun. And, and if anybody's ever yeah. asked me, it's like it happens all the time. It's like, hey, what's good? Oh, they see me at a brewery and like, oh Ben, I want to talk about my rear derailleur. It's like, mm, no, <laughs> I want to tell you something. I want to tell you my favorite thing, which is riding bikes with homies at night in the mountains with really good lights. And so day one checked all the boxes. Um, as far as I was concerned, we were like right on target with, uh, with our goals. And uh, we did have one little issue. We had a, a, an individual who kind of came on later and uh, he, I think he was a little underprepared. And so he just kind of like turned around and, and camped out on his own. 
um, that first night. But uh, as you'll see, the you know the, the group dynamics they worked themselves out just just fine. I don't know, Mike. Yeah, maybe yeah. you want to uh, speak to like your experience joining in, like a ragtag bunch of you know fresh faces and like okay, here we yeah. go. Yeah, I didn't really know quite what I was going to be getting into, and uh, you know I've ridden bikes during the day and I've gone for bike rides at night, but I've never ridden from the daytime into the nighttime and. That change of atmosphere and environment was definitely memorable and um, really a cool experience to kind of sit there with the changing lights, the changing of the day, and not really know when you're going to stop. You know, like the hours are ticking by. We're still just riding bikes deeper into the mountains, and uh, you know, there's supposed to be a volcano there, but we couldn't see it. Um, <laughs> But when we did see it, it was very, very damn cool. So, yeah, yeah I, so I would definitely recommend it. <laughs> by the next day, as Mike was just mentioning, we were having a blast, um, despite <laughs> having lost a soul. And then Ben mentioned earlier, Adam showed up. So we uh, we leave in the morning, we break camp, and we're rolling to the trailhead. And um, there was some some chatter, I think, on the phone that maybe Adam would be showing up from Olympia, or maybe he'd meet us on the other side, or we didn't know. And, and within like ten minutes, we get to the trailhead, and and he was already there, right, Ben? Yeah, yeah, he was. He was ready. He had his shirt off. He was like, "Let's let's go." And uh, uncanny, I tell you. Yeah, um, yeah, that was right at the trailhead where our pavement turned. In, uh, you know, we did pavement for the first uh, I don't know sixty-five miles. And then is a yeah sixty seven point five yeah we we hit single track straight away after that um, and for those who are following along from home um, you know the, the the plains of Abraham is a international mountain bike association recognized um, epic trail um, and so it was going to be a pretty good day. <laughs> yeah, I remember sitting there eating a tuna fish wrap and this other guy just shows up out of nowhere and just joins us and i'm like it was crazy <laughs> just so serendipitous too perfect to be true yeah it was like, an added element to the convergence that yeah we just kind of were in that space and and he just he just <laughs> rolled up so we, we uh at this point adam was with us and we began the traverse across the plains of abraham um which is it feels like a moonscape if you've never been up there i, I can't recommend it highly enough um day night evening it's just it's it's otherworldly the the damage that was left there from the volcano erupting um so we took some photos my man steve uh, and then you know we're working our way across the other side this is the best roller coaster you can ride i think that's dylan and then ben in the background um this is kind of on the northeast side of the blast zone so just off to the right of this overlaid photo is the the wow factor is where the <laughs> millions of tons of mud and ice and snow and ash all exploded out northwards and, and caused so much damage so we made it through there fortunately no more volcanic eruptions um and we made it to windy ridge which was kind of our next little sector um back on the paved road here but the devastation from the blast here is just so so apparent um you can see just you know there's no vegetation left whereas on the other side we we're coming up through a, a deep lush old forest um this is a view of spirit lake which is a, a cool phenomenon of the eruption all the what looks like beach here in the background is um massive tree trunks and these are the trees that were uprooted stripped of their vegetation and and uh transported in the in the pyroclastic flow all the way down uh, into this lake that was created at the same time. Um, and the scale of this is all just unbelievable to get to ride up and over it and then look back at it was really humbling. So we were we were taking our time here and um, enjoying the sunshine and, and really enjoying the the wonder of nature. Yeah, and, and then, uh, you know, you ask the, the the park rangers and the locals and there there's three forests worth of trees in spirit lake and uh, it being a national heritage site those trees cannot be removed for for commercial commercial use and 
sure, sure somebody has probably towed one out of there, but um, th those shall remain. And it's, it's, it's quite impressive to see the amount of hardwood, um, not just floating on the top, but you, you, you know, there's six times as much like in the, in the lake itself. Um, and that lake itself was directly in the path of the flow. So, um, that it's still there is, is really pretty cool. Um, and, uh, and kind of like coming over the hump and then down the ridge, hurricane ridge, windy ridge to, to see that it's, 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 it's breathtaking and in singular in, in its, uh, epicness. Had you been to that area before we rode through there, Mike? I had not been through there before. It's yeah. How, how was that? It's totally shocking, to be honest. I mean, it's just a totally different environment and world. Um, I have such a distinct memory coming down Windy Ridge, and it is windy. It's not a joke. <laughs> like you're fighting to stay on this really tight, narrow track with kind of significant drop-offs on either side. Um, not a lot of room for air, but you're just like blasting down from the side of a volcano and can't really say I've had this, an experience like that before. So we, we made our way up and out of the direct blast zone into a, a different watershed just north of the volcano. Um, so we're kind of out of the view of the volcano and, and back in the deep kind of endor forest here. Um, there's Katie for scale on the left, and then on the right, you can see our nighttime objective, the Green River Trail, and then our morning objective, uh, Vance and Peak. Um, and actually, Ben, can you talk about the water spigot situation in this moment? Oh, yeah. So uh, uh, I think it was like shortly before this climb, we're, we're, we're now staring at what would be our campsite for night two. Um, we were going to come through a parking lot trailhead. And I'd been in contact with the park rangers. Here we are. This is what, uh, June 22nd. Um, and, you know, talking with p people is so much better than like relying on a, an updated website. And according to the park rangers, they were going to unlock the, the hand pump water spigots at those trailheads like three days before. So kind of was key to unlocking the, the backside of this route um, was a was a water refuel. Now we could have pushed on. I think it would have been about 20 miles or so to to complete this climb where you were starting on the pavement to complete the climb, and then descend into the river valley down the Green River Trail. Um, but hey, having water at that point crossing the plains of Abraham would have been fantastic. But the thing was locked. Um, <laughs> the thing was locked, and and I and I think I heard everybody's jaw hit the ground mm. at the same time. It was like yeah. a um, so we were stuck there for like almost an hour, right? Before a rescue seemed like forever, but some friendly hikers came, um, and had a couple of extra gallons in the back of their pickup. And it was just beautifully back of car conditioned on this hot summer afternoon, but it was, it was the yummiest water we had had tasted. <laughs> Maybe even yummier than Mike's tuna sandwich. I don't <laughs> No, probably not. <laughs> probably not. Was, you had like a glass Pyrex. I, I think it does speak to one of the like the here in the Northwest and the in the mountain regions is is like when do, when does the high country become accessible? And as you can see, even here at the solstice, we were really pushing it. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. I, I having called the ranger station, having received the the you know it's it's unlocked. Um, I really thought that I wasn't going to put anybody or the route was going to put anybody into into harm's way um and as it was you know the, the 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 trailhead angels that are out there uh came and you know unlocked Safety day. yeah 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 they unlocked the green river trail you're right <laughs> so that that was a great example of how even though we'd all been strangers 18 hours prior to this we were now kind of moving through these pretty difficult challenges not having water together and you know figuring out how we were going to move on. Um, like, is there going to be more water ahead? Are we going to have a campsite? How are our tuna sandwich reserves doing? Do we have enough tortilla wraps left? Um, so eventually we, we arrived at camp and we're at the base of this climb and, and decided as a group that we were not going to make the ascent that evening, even though there was 
still light and we were feeling pretty zesty from coming down from the volcano. Um, but we decided instead, like, you know, everyone kind of identified their needs and, and vocalized their wants. And um, we decided to just stop for a cup of coffee, had a little brew up um, right by the, by the river and then um, called it an early evening so we could get some rest and, and get some food before the morning. And that turned out to be absolutely the right choice because um, you note the elevation here, we're at 2,800 feet. Um, and Ben had told us, as Jason mentioned earlier, um, this might be kind of a type two ride where you're not having fun in the moment, but looking back here, you were like, oh, that was absolutely a blast. And knowing how Ben rides, I was like, okay, there'll be some underbrush, there'll be some roots, we'll be on skinny tires on big rocks, but it'll be great. And it ended up, so elevation 2,800 feet. Two and a half miles later, we were perched on the side of a mountain, pushing up through fog um, and really feeling the immensity of the forest. Um, Mike, you had a pretty big bike. How was this hiking segment for you? Yeah, that was a, it was a challenging morning hike with, with a bike in hand. <laughs> um, in retrospect, it was definitely the right choice to camp at the lower elevation for that night and then tackle that massive climb in the morning. Um, I think we were all just too gassed and probably would have pushed the limits of safety at that point, trying to mm -hmm. tackle that heading into the evening. Um, but yeah, pushing a heavy bike up a mountain is fun still. <laughs> Looking back. I mean, I, I, I spent a good amount of time like selling the downhill. The downhill yeah. was, was, you know. And... I, I was sold. <laughs> yeah, getting up, getting up in order to get back down. And it should be said that the downhill unanimously was so worth the payoff, so worth the push. We knew we had to stay on a pretty decent pace in order to make it back to our trains, um, which would leave with or without us. We didn't have tickets. We didn't have reservations. We were just going to um, hoof it. And so we were feeling pretty exposed going up that steep hiking section. Um, but the other side really, really paid off. I think Ben used the word jazz to describe it. I don't know if you can talk about that a little more. <laughs> Jazz. J-A-double-Z. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the real highlight of this downhill is a lovely little grotto spot called Cathedral Falls. Um, there's a whole series of smaller little cave overlooks along this trail. And then out of nowhere, we were just smacked with this view. You can see Ryan in the foreground and, and Kevin a little further along. Um, and then where they're going is down here behind that pine tree. So we all kind of stacked up here, just rubbernecking and oogling the nature. And um, it was just like this amazing little serene moment amidst this unending flowy roller coaster. Um, but not without its sketch factor, like that's pretty loose. I think we all rode the top half of it and then kind of skittered down. And then as Ryan's demonstrating, felt better on the other side. Um, and then here's a, just one last little uh, angle of Dylan in that. So where he's standing is right about here. So you get that front angle of that tree and, you know, there's like 150 feet of water cascading down. And um, was this new for you as well, Ben, this spot? Uh, this was the part that we had uh, scoped out previously to determine if it's doable. And when we actually, you know, so there's, there's probably like six miles of trail above this. It's all single track. It's pretty, pretty buff. I think, I think a lot of hikers use it as well. Um, but when I came to this it was like, yeah, this is what we're going to do. It doesn't matter what's above here. Um, and yeah, you, I mean, I can't encourage people enough to, to explore their backyard. If, if this is the kind of stuff that's in your backyard, like, you know, get to it. Um, this, this was, like you said, it was like big time, big, big, big time was, was incredible. Um, yeah. and you know, the tech, the, the trail isn't incredibly technical. It's probably a blue and here for, for this section where there's just so much going on, like riding your bike doesn't seem like the most important thing. So like, I, yeah, I think we all dismounted, took a, whipped out our cameras and had a, had a little session here. Um, yeah. This was this is my it was my first time beyond the falls. <laughs> we'd made it this 
this far. And so we were kind of, we didn't realize it, but this was like the last big, the last big gift. We were kind of coming out of the mountain zone, um, but we weren't, we weren't quite done yet. Um, so we had to have the, the traditional bike packing lunch and sock changing behind the thrift way. Um, this is down in Morton, back down in the river Valley. Um, and we had a, a nice little, little siesta in the afternoon here after being locked up in the forest for at this point, two full days. And we saw, I think maybe five or six other people in that time. Um, so it was kind of, it was almost a shock to come back to, to town. Um, you can see the bikes in the distance there. And then we just grabbed some close up rigs because the other big part of this ride, obviously, is that we didn't know what everybody else was running. We didn't know what everybody else was bringing. Um, and so we, as many folks as we had on the ride, we had as many interpretations of a bike pack and rig. Um, a lot of similarities, but also a lot of differences and everything was pretty much um, unique to everybody who was there. So it was, it was nice to see the commonalities and, and learn what was working for other people. The bike in the top right that Katie rode was fresh off the Oregon Outback um, and then turned around and did this in a, a really short time span. Um, actually, Mike's bike is in the top left there. Uh, it looks like it came together pretty well. What did, you, what did you have going on there, Mike? Yeah, it's actually the same bike that Katie was riding, uh, cross division. Awesome, completely awesome bike. Um, maybe a little bit thick on the tires for the pavement sections, but super happy to have them on the single track and coming through that Mars type landscape through the blast zone. So, yeah, I was I was keeping up with everybody, and at the downhills, I was just totally flying. <laughs> So we came together quickly and then um, before we knew it really, the, the ride was over um, and we had to begin our, our goodbye process. But at this point, remember, we are still racing the train calendar, the train schedule, I mean. Um, this is back when we could just pull up at a picnic table and eat together. Uh, looking back at this photo is odd. <laughs> um, but we, we got some pictures and we got some, I think, fries and pizzas and caught a, a 7.55 train to Portland and an 8.15 train to Seattle, having started down in the valley, traversed up and over the volcano, uh, and then had a nice little forest bath on the way back to the I-5 corridor. It's not all glamorous, though. There were a, a few banks and bonks on the way down. Uh, here's just a quick rundown of two days together, how that, how that panned out for some frames and some some bodies. Everybody made it out safe though, which was good to hear. Um, if you'd like to check out this route, it is available on Ride with GPS. Um, I'm sure that'll be linked later though. Uh, Jason can clarify that. Um, that's pretty much it. We would like to say thank you to some folks. Um, ben, can you talk about Kyle's art contribution here? Right. Yeah. This was uh, early on. We were just kind of rallying around the idea of like just some sort of, uh, I don't know, an image to like fire it up. And Kyle, good friend, uh, artist, screen printer down with the woods, down with the metal. Um, he's like, yeah, I'd love to take a crack at it. And it was just like, this is a, and, and he just ran with it. He's, um, I think, I think he nailed it. And then when that came on board, we were like, oh, wow, that's like, uh, that's like something I want to do or, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> um, and, that's what uh, Nick and I roped in. <laughs> Sick cover art, you know? Right, right. Um, you know, and that was a challenge was to like, is, is this, is this cool? And I, and I think like for those at home listening, watching, it's, if you come and visit the Pacific Northwest, whether it be Portland, Olympia, um, Seattle, like, uh, you know, maybe carve a little bit of time out of your schedule and, and, and something like this, it's, it's uh, you know, contact Jason and Martina at, at Swift for, for something similar or, you know, Miles or, or myself here at Back Alley. Um, it's like a, kind of a special thing and uh, it, it takes you through, um, you know, People th people want to ride the coast, and they or they want to ride from like Seattle down to you know Mexico or something. Well, 
you know, this, the, the Washington coast, pardon my French, but it's kind of garbage. You know, you're like on average, like seven to 10 miles from the actual coast and you're sharing the roadway with, with trucks and, and semis and, and logging trucks. Um, well, in Cascadia, um, taking that opportunity to, to experience the volcanoes, Rainier, Adams, Mount St. Helens, um, the Columbia River, um, you know, take on the Cascades while you're visiting the Northwest and, and then work your way to the coast in Oregon and then complete your trip there. Um, the, the, the Washington coast is kind of a joke. I mean, not like ha ha funny, but like it's not the best riding. For adventure riding. Yeah. 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 I, I, I would agree. What do you think, Jason? <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, yeah. If you, if you like, I always encourage people, if you're, if you're doing the Pacific coast route, like the, the standard kind of, I guess, ACA like route, they, they have you go down to hood canal. And I used to say, you know, ride the coast, but the, eh, our coast, our coast isn't really like coast riding. Um, it yeah. It isn't quite like feather in the cap sort of riding. It's, it's yeah. highway miles with like a, a wide shoulder and you know, you get, you get, rolled pretty easy, pretty pretty much all day long yeah but but there are really good opportunities to get off of the highway if you choose to hug the coastal section rather than the hood canal section um but i would like to say that like your route looks amazing and um mount st helens and the gifford pinchot which is the name of the the national forest that a majority of their ride was in is is one of my favorites and um if any of you out there choose to ride in this area like on mountain bikes or gravel bikes or you're under biking or over biking or whatever you're doing just be respectful because it's i i feel like it's one of the the only places that we can ride with with like that vicinity of a volcano like you're yes. you're like less than volcanoes. a mile you're like like a quarter of a mile from a volcano in the in the u.s and that's pretty amazing and there's trails that you can actually ride your bike on so if you go there if you go to mount st helens you're riding the gifford pinchot just be respectful of the hikers and the walkers and all the other people that are using the trail because it's kind of a precious thing. Yeah. Certainly. We're all trying to use it together, right? Like we didn't plan this route with as big a group as showed up. And so that was another thing to navigate was getting everybody through it comfortably. Hey, we're going to work through a couple of these questions here. Awesome. Uh, was tough breathing in such high altitudes? We, uh, I don't think elevation wise, we weren't, extremely high i think we were under 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 five under five thousand feet yep. um i've got asthma and it was it, it seemed fine it seemed fine mike um, had a weird little inhaler thing yeah that weird funky inhaler I we, were definitely, we were definitely high <laughs> <laughs> um and then uh the plains of abraham uh queens mustafa yeah um, hike a bike. It was just the morning of day three. So it was about three, uh, about three and a half, four miles, I think. And it was, it was a kind of squirrel. Um, it's the kind of hiking where, you know, you're going to be hiking. It's, I think maybe somebody I tried to be a hero it. once and like ride a section. It's like, you know, you're going to, you're going to pop, you're going to blow the entire load just like on a 10 yard section. So kind of like hiking it. Um, it percentage wise, um, three, two, yeah. it was a bike ride, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, if I saw that poster, I would go to that concert, yeah, I'd get in that mosh pit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you guys sleep? Did you bring shelters? Were you just bivying? Were you doing? Were you just sleeping on the trail? I had a tent. Um, I borrowed a tent from my brother, and 
um, managed to strap that onto a funky little rack that I have. Um, so that was super comfy and I had some private space to change my socks in the morning and, and brew some coffee. I think Mike, you had, you had the sickest tent of all. Yeah, I've got this pretty nice shelter thing. It's just like a kind of a pyramid. Um, but that second night, I mean, we were literally camping on like six inches of moss and Whoa. incredibly soft clover and you didn't need anything. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, could have just slept under the stars, no problem. Yeah. And you were baby, right? Yeah, we. Uh, I, I think I might. Have, I had like a SOL um, emergency bivy that uh, you know, incredibly lightweight. It's like Tyvek material, and uh, I didn't even need it. I didn't even. I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Uh, I think kind of part of the plan was was like ride more more riding. You know, we we would regroup or we would hang out and eat and have have a coffee, whatever. But um, you know, as people you know mild you know we do some riding and it's like it's about riding the bike um stopping in um in powwow is is like a a, a small chunk of it but uh, you know i'm i was like on my pad in a bag and uh the window was keeping up with the weather report that it was going to be pretty clear so um yeah minimal shelter and that's kind of how i like it um all right we have one last question. Well, this is the last question we're going to take. Um, how do you physically prepare for such a challenging ride? Yeah, the uh, so, I, I, that's Mike? a great question. <laughs> yeah, I think we all had a different approach. Uh, mine was partly fear based. This was the biggest. Uh, self-supported off-road route that I had done and um, I I didn't know anybody well enough to feel comfortable that I could at the beginning know that I could rely on anybody for you know a bailout or so I kind of went into it just like I'm gonna get through this like mm -hmm. it was a it was a mental feat I think more than a, a physical one for me I think I it's a great question because you know, as, as I don't know, I'll just take the where the feather is like, you know, I, I, these are everybody here was vetted and and I've ridden with everybody uh, in this group. And I and I knew that there was proficiency. Um, I think I I think I've been with everybody when they've reached their edge. And it was like it's it's it, it's it's far enough out there. Like we, we honestly we didn't we didn't do 100 miles in a day, which is such a weird little but it's it's kind of like an idea of a of a threshold, you know. Sixty miles of off road is easily as challenging as a hundred road miles. Um, but uh, you know, how did you physically prep for such a challenge? Sleep, sleep a little bit the the, the week in advance, get rest. Um, physically prep. Uh, I, I I think one of the keys to a successful trip is is have snacks that you really like. You know, if if you're like, oh, cliff bars, I, I'll do a cliff bar when like I'm in the hole, you know, that's one thing, but like, how about some like jerky or, or like, how about some cheese or like, you know. They're, they're... I had avocados. <laughs> or yeah, tuna yeah. fish. Or I, whole had, avocados. <laughs> I had a whole tub of pre-made tuna fish with mayo and pickles and everything. <laughs> it was a glass, it was a glass. Like Pyrex Tupperware. Let's yeah, it's it stayed fine. We we're only out there for a few days. Proper it's away. <laughs> I shared. <laughs> I think I think all that being said, um, there was a, a long list of riders in the region in Portland, Olympia, here, Bellingham. Um, I mean, would have been a would have been a great time. It, it, in the end, uh, what did we have? Seven or eight people? Seven people that were like. You know, if you get a large group, then things like slow down dramatically. It's hard to maintain momentum and something happens. We we got pretty lucky. Despite that damage report, we kept a pretty steady progress. Uh, pace was, was was rolling. And when it was epic, we, we all stopped and we knew. But, you know, if, if we had a group of 10 or more or such as like, you know, Jason with like the the the, the solstice overnight, like that's a that's a that's a production and you, you know your experience with like the, uh, was it the the Skate Creek or the not Skate Creek the uh, the the 
Ipsit Creek. Um, you know, it, it's it's you, you you can't you can't you just it's kind of a fuzzy gray logic that how are you gonna you know fifteen people we'd still be out there. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that'd be better <laughs> if we we're still out there. We'd, but uh, <laughs> you know, you got to keep it keep it at a. That was part of the logistics was keep it a, a size a, a group that can move, can move together. And, you know, everybody has like that kind of attitude of like, we might not know each other, but we, we know the rider types. Um, so that was, that was one of the things I think that enabled the success of the, the, the whole trip. And, you know, it, it, it's gotta be said that at one point Dylan headed out the morning of the day three, he had to meet his family in Packwood or, or at, you know, that's striking distance from where we camped. So he, he, he went on his own adventure and Adam Hale, had to be Adam Hale, so he left early in the morning, and you know it was a beast. He rode to Olympia. He rode to Olympia. Yeah, he didn't need no stinking train. Um, so to answer your question, Jesse, I think bring some snacks and and take a nap and communicate uh, with your riding partners the pace that you wish to ride at. Cool. Thanks, guys. I think with that, I'm going to bring back all the other presenters for a moment to say good night. <laughs> I had then, to stop yeah. Tinder swiping. Sorry. No, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Here's y'all. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Swift. Who showed up in YouTube. And thanks for you all for presenting tonight. I'm sure I'll see you all soon in real life because we all we live can. in the same city. I can. And right. Yeah, look forward to the next one. These Stokes Spoke Adventure Series are super cool. Yeah. February, uh, February 24th <laughs> is our uh, WTF NB night. So reach Jason, out. What does NB stand for? Uh, non binary. Non binary. And women trans femme non-binary for the complete thing. Um, reach out. Have a good night, everybody. Awesome. Thanks for hosting this, Jason. Thank you. Thanks for hosting us. Thanks, y'all. Power to the Puget. Yoo-hoo.